nothing is foreign and nothing is normal and it's all perspective, you know, it's all relative. I am a bunch of different stories that I can, I choose to keep telling myself. Maybe I, this story doesn't serve me anymore. Maybe I don't want to say that's who I am. Welcome to Heart of Change podcast, where we explore heroic and inspiring stories of change. Today, I'm sitting down with James William Harrop. James is a Londoner turned Berliner since 2012. He's the owner and operator of Pure Story, a company that helps you rewrite the narrative and own your story. James has spent the last 20 years designing, illustrating, writing, directing, and publishing stories. He is the creator of Pure Story Systems, a strategic narrative system that helps you both own and execute your story. James has supported individuals, international corporations, independent startups, and global change makers. Today, James shares with us the importance of changing your story and changing your mind. I look forward to a great conversation with James. I'm sure you'll find what he has to say, both interesting and helpful. It's great to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, uh, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. So we chatted briefly on the phone and really enjoyed your energy. We had a great conversation about trees and how trees have their brains underground and not above ground, which I found to be a fun conversation. Yeah, it was the, this idea of brain chauvinism, that as humans, we always think the brain is, uh, is at the top and uh, that's why when you cut off a tree and then you walk down the street the next year, it's <laughs> sprouted <laughs> mm-hmm. massively. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the, that's the trouble with, with humans. I think we, uh, we're quite chauvinistic in our, uh, in our view of other life. Right. And, and also our view of ourselves, I think, in a lot of ways. You created a navigation system that helps people get to the core of their story to change their view. How did you create this navigation system and why? Um, I created it actually through lived experience, let's say, rather than kind of taking a methodology and, and reapplying it, I really kind of went through my lived experience of of story um, and the why of it was to really give people a way to kind of get the story out of themselves because we we don't we have stories within us we are, we are living in stories and just to create something that can give you that sense of perspective where you can get it and you can look at it and you can see it as a whole and you can see it clearly and then you can work with it from that starting point to sort of break out of the kind of story. Um, <laughs> I hesitate to say the word matrix because it is, is quite a loaded, a loaded term these days. But let's call it that, you know, the, the, the story, story web, let's say, that we live in. Right. Uh, so that outside influences by society that sort of navigate what we think about ourselves is that what you're referencing? Yeah, I mean, society is built, you know, cultures are built, our reality is built out of these stories that we don't even realize that they're stories anymore. They're kind of so big and they're so uh, pervasive and so uh, quote unquote normal that we don't even kind of think to question that they might be stories and we think to question that they might be something that we could uh, rewrite, that we could, that we could change. Mm. It sounds like it, you might be tapping into the subconscious mind discussion of what is going on with our reality under the cuff. Yeah, and um, what can I just ask you? What do you uh, mean by the subconscious mind uh, discussion? To me, the subconscious mind is the tape that's playing when you're not aware. So you're driving a car from A to B, from your house to the grocery store. And sometimes you don't even realize how you got there. You miss the whole route to the grocery store. And I think that often we're kind of moving through our lives with this tape underneath or this narrative that's not ours. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's, you know, that's accrued from both kind of individual experiences, but also, yeah, this kind of this greater narrative, these greater narratives 
come from the cultures that they grew up in, each person having one of these great big rich stories individual to them, and then reducing it to like one to one word. Because our brains are sort of these reduction engines. We want we want to simplify stuff because it makes life livable. If we really were had to process all the information that's coming to us, we wouldn't be able to function. So we boil it down and we reduce it. That's what I like about living in a country that I didn't grow up in, actually. When you step out of your story, which can, we can call it national identity, and step into another story, you see all the things that perhaps don't fit, and you're like, okay, well, that was normal. Um, even like crossing your fingers, let's say. Uh, in the UK and in the US, we'd cross our fingers for like, um, you know, ah, oh, I hope so, keep your fingers crossed. And in uh, Germany, in Berlin, uh, where we live now, you press your thumbs. And I remember thinking, like, press your thumbs? Like, that's weird. <laughs> why? But that's normal, is it? Like, what, why? What is, what is normal? What is, uh, well, what do I really think? There's almost an unconscious bias and a blind spot, right? But that we, we don't, just don't know the things that we can't see that aren't in front of us and changing our environment often does create that, uh, that learning for us. What do you think that um, people can do in order to be more aware? Because not everybody can move to another country, right, to have that experience. So what are things that the everyday person can do to help them um, open up their mind and be aware of their story? I think the first thing to do is just to kind of be, be aware the things that you think are normal and the things that you think are just the way it is. And now, casually, <laughs> set this as a new tape to play, let's put it like that, that as you are walking through your day, as you are living your life, just now be aware of those little things that you consider to be normal and that you consider to be strange and different. And be like, you know, what? who defined that? Like, are they? Or are they just two equally valid points on a kind of infinite playing board, an infinite sort of scale of, of, of strangeness or normalness. Everything is, is, is normal or everything is strange if you want it to be and there's beauty in both options. And I guess, yeah, just kind of look for the, for the beauty in it and the, and the wonder in it and sort of become a discoverer, a, an explorer of that. Do you think there's one major story that people really uh, hang on to? How do we pick and choose in our story? It's It can seem so simple in knowing who we are and knowing what our story is, but then it can seem so complicated too. Yeah, I think I think the one story that we can agree that we all carry is that I'm normal. I'm normal. They're weird. <laughs> I'm normal. That's weird. Like... Um, and to give a, a, a sort of lived example, when I was eating a currywurst, the national dish, uh, well, the city, city's the, the kind of local um, speciality. And I was standing there eating it, at, you know, everyone's got their best currywurst place and one of the ones that somebody said was the best. <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, I'll tell you where the best one is. No. Um, and I was eating it and I was like, oh, look at this weird, like, what, this weird, like, sausage and this weird kind of curry ketchup with some powder on it. Wow, this is such crazy, weird, like, foreign food. I was like, oh, hang on, no, 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 this is the normal local food. I am the foreigner. And I was like, no, I'm not foreign, I'm normal, I'm me, you know? And suddenly the whole kind of concept of, of foreignness, like, burst open and like a little metal box that had been holding my brain was kind of, like, open and, woo. And I expanded to sort of fill this new space of like, oh, wow, nothing is foreign and nothing is normal. And it's all perspective, you know, it's all relative. And that was a, um, a wonderful sort of revelation. And I tell this as if it was a revelation that the epiphany of the curry burst. Actually, I think it happened over time, but my brain condenses it down into a nice story and a nice sort of analogy. But the... But the sort of the result was the same, that this was this sort of understanding of normal, I'm normal, of course, suddenly was uh, was sort of deconstructed. And I think once that one kind of that is the prevailing narrative, let's say, that I think everybody would would agree, 
that they think they're they're normal. If that kind of one is cracked, then perhaps you, you're able to look in and see all these other little narrative strands that have weaved together to make you who you are. And then I don't know if unpicking them is uh, is how you want to spend your time. Maybe there's uh, a, there's a lot of kind of wisdom traditions that I think would suggest you know unpick it all, and then what would you be left with? Um, but I think even you know without full kind of ego death <laughs> mm -hmm. um, might be a big ask. But even without that, just the sort of this this sort of initial understanding that okay, yeah, like I am a bunch of different stories that I can I choose to keep telling myself. Um, maybe I, this story doesn't serve me anymore. Maybe I don't want to say that's who I am. Uh, maybe I want to change this, you know, I'll take this one thread and I'll, I'll, I'll reweave it. Do you think it's, it's good to constantly rewrite your narrative? Yeah, I think so. I think I do. Um, I think the kind of the idea of the sort of, of the sort of fixed point, the sort of unchanging, um, stoic kind of being, that's not going to serve our times. The, you know, the only constant is change and things seem to be changing faster than ever before. I think you would soon find whatever model that you decided, whatever story you said, yeah, this is, this is going to be the one, I'm going to stick with it, would soon, very soon kind of not be fit for purpose. I spoke to a friend um, and it was actually talking about uh, a kind of Californian psychedelic retreat or something like this. And he's really not that like kind of guy for some people not for others I mean that's fine um and he was like oh, I really don't want to do it I spent all this time building up my house you know like my myself I spent a lot of time you know invested in building this house I don't just want to go and like burn it down and tear it down um and the very clever reply which I didn't think of at the time but fortunately <laughs> fortunately I have it now uh is well yeah you don't want to tear your whole house down but maybe you want to clean out the cellar, you know, and like, you know, get all that crap out of the attic and, you know, that, that room that's just full of boxes that you never unpacked, you know, maybe you don't need that stuff. And, you know, why is that carpet so lumpy in the living room that you've just been sweeping stuff under? Like maybe it's, you know, it doesn't have to be the full sort of um, wrecking ball. It can be uh, perhaps a more, you know, housekeeping type affair, spring clean. I think as we continue to evolve as humans, we sort of uh, do refine ourselves, you know, almost like chipping away and, you know, they say the diamond that's inside of the, the rock or something, I'm botching that, but there's this <laughs> whole, you know, refining the human spirit. But I would think that there's a core to the story that stays constant. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely way to see it. Um, this kind of that a lifetime would be just sort of refining this this jewel, so by the end you're left with this sort of you know perfectly uh, polished. So I'm seeing it less as a kind of cut diamond, more of as a nice sort of smooth stone that's just been kind of worn and worked. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I think a lot of time it's more just like it's more like a kind of barnacle encrusted sort of like <laughs> it's just a crude kind of stuff, you know. And actually, it's this big sort of like it's sort of. Uh, atrophied and and stuck with just kind of stuff that has uh, that has just been uh, yeah accrued over a, a lifetime. I'm thinking of my father quite kind of clearly here, like fully sort of atrophied and not able to move because you sort of stuck stuff to you and you're not willing to kind of. It, it would be frightening to kind of clear that off and see what lies beneath. Um, in answer to the question. Um, what is that shining stone? Um, I'd love to say love. I'd love to say that that is, as, as human beings, that is our 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 pure heart. Um, I would I would love to believe that, and that's a story I choose to believe and tell. But I think the true story, the only thing we can really say for sure, is I am. That's what. When when you take away everything, when you you know you really polish that stone down to its like its core, the only thing that can be sure is I am. Even if it's a simulation, you know, even if it's the freaking matrix, like you still still I am is the only thing you can know. 
and I will go for the love story because that's the story I want to I want to tell for sure but the only thing that you can know for sure I think at the end is I am that's profound I want to read a, a quote from your website it says stories are everything they shape and define our world that's because our brains are wired not just to hear see and understand stories but to actively feel them that's why they are so effective at informing opinion they literally change our minds oh yeah that's nice <laughs> that sounds good so when you say feel stories mm -hmm. what do you mean i don't think there's two there's two kind of there's two ways two meanings one is a kind of neuroscience uh the neuroscience story let's say um and i am no in no ways a neuroscientist so this information is you know i haven't tested this information myself i haven't run these experiments but i've read a lot about them and if i say to you now ah yeah this morning i was standing by a lake and and the cold icy wind whipping around my legs and I was getting myself ready and I jumped into the water and it was freezing and I couldn't catch my breath. If we were examining your brain activity, the centers in your brain that feel cold would be lighting up. You would literally be feeling cold, the, the experience of, of feeling cold. And these are kind of mirror neurons also. So when I sort of say something, you, you kind of mirror me. Um, it's why like after watching you know, James Bond film or something, mm -hmm. you come out and you're all <laughs> James Bondy, because literally your brain has been changed by the by the story. The same that if you read hateful stuff on Twitter or I refuse to call it X, um, and I don't I don't use it anyway for my mental health, uh, because if somebody is saying horrible things about you and you read them, your body responds with a uh, the fight or flight response, you know, it's the same as if you're being physically attacked. So we feel these stories, even these little kind of micro hateful stories of a 142 characters. It's not anymore, is it? Um, we feel it like we feel them. Um, and the second meaning is that we think that we make decisions based on information. We like to think that we are, you know, we, we weigh up the facts and we, we check it out and, and we act on the information. But actually we act on emotion, we act on feeling, and then we, maybe we need a bit of information to, to back it up, to, to be like, okay, yeah, that's, that's the right thing you do, to do. We need the information to kind of push the uh, decision across the line, but actually it's an emotional kind of gut feeling decision. Ah. Wow. I did hear one time that um, you remember not what people do, but how they make you feel, which seems to be in alignment with this. Yeah. I mean, let's look at uh, the Donald Trump effect. Like he literally says something and somebody says, well, no, no, you, that's not true. Like, here's the proof. You know, there's a video of you <laughs> doing the opposite like thing that you just said. So it doesn't matter, you know. And obviously to the people who are watching him and are voting for him, he makes them feel a certain way. And then so all the facts, you know, ah, facts schmacks. Um, and on one hand, I sort of like, uh, OK, are we living in this? Are we living in the, the age of story where now it's no longer about kind of it's not about the facts. Let's just, you know, we want we want to go with the best story and uh, we want to go with the story that makes us makes us feel a certain way that makes us feel good that makes us feel powerful that makes us feel like we're heard and that we we belong and that we uh our life is meaningful um and so okay then let's let's us uh, i don't like the us and them story but let's uh other people who aren't such what if people with love who choose the story of love let's say um what if uh they we us or what if we all decided to you know write the story that we wanted to to see in the world that we wanted to feel and did it with the same kind of energy and the same effectiveness 
as that that other story, the kind of story of division and the story of 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 fear and uh, and hate, and see what and let's see what happens with that. And uh, not that there's no place for um, proper investigative journalism and you know facts and finding stuff out, but like let's please do let's do that too. No, but that's not my skill set. I'm not a a, a journalist or a scientist. But let let's just make a story for good and uh, and see how that see how that plays out. Mm-hmm. Can it be as effective? So if we are focusing on having stories that are driven by feelings versus information, how how is that changing things on a broader perspective in society as we start to 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 change the way that we leverage stories? Um. Again, I'm pretty sure it's always been like that, but maybe now with the awareness of it, maybe now we're aware of it, and maybe now we we understand it a bit better, and maybe now we can consciously craft it that way, and see and see what and see what happens, and then you know let's all beam off into space as cosmic rainbow beings, and you know explore the explore and experience the universe as one beautiful consciousness like that that sounds that sounds like a better happier ending to the story your um company is called pure story what does pure mean where did you come up with that um in this in this context it's not it's not that idea that we spoke about of the of the kind of pure soul necessarily at the heart of of each human Although now I'm saying it, maybe it comes to the same point. It's more a process of of kind of of purification, let's say, like an alchemic process of distillation and crystallization and creating something that is pure in its essence and also in its kind of purpose, I think. I don't work for people who <laughs> do bad things. <laughs> That sounds so very naive the way I say it. Can I frame it a bit a, a better way? Um, I work for people with with purpose and finding their their kind of pure story is a double. It has a double a, another double meaning. Let's say that the, the the story is pure because it has been purified through through the process. To imagine the you know the alchemic jars and the spirally glass thing and the drop comes out and at the end you have the the essence, um, but also they are of pure of heart, let's say, and that doesn't mean I mean that's still people who are doing something for profit, um, but they're doing it for profit for good. Um, because how could you really start a business in the twenty twenties and not have a sort of social and environmental good at at its uh, as your sort of primary concern, along with doing, a, creating a business that feeds you and your family, and you know keeps you in a nice life that you that you want to live. That's all. That's all okay too. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, it's finding that that kind of essence. That's the that's the sort of pure purity. And then if it's the essence of a story for good. And that's kind of double pure. That's the good stuff. Mm. And then combining two people that have the similar story, then you become, get the collective story and it creates even more more momentum and more force. Mm. How can storytelling uh, be used as a powerful tool? Um, this is, there's an interesting distinction here that I'd like to make. Um, so far, we've been talking about story. And now we're talking about storytelling, and it's something that I that I come up a, a lot when working with, um, when I work with people, and they say our oh, storytelling, or I don't, and they say our oh, storytelling will do that with when the marketing budget comes in. You know, we'll do that. Like first, we've got to get this part right. You know, we've got to get the um, the business straight and the kind of you know the production, whatever it might be. And actually, story in its kind of in this pure essence, and this is why I also use the term strategic narrative, which is coined by a guy, Andy Raskin, 
And um, strategic narrative is because it will show you what to do. It will show you where to go in any kind of decision making. So it will help you. It will not only guide you, but it will help you in kind of communication, of course. But you, it gives you that that first that like that north star and that that purpose because it becomes very clear for you. But you then are able to share that with your investor or your co-founder or your team or the designer or the whoever it might be, and of course your audience. Um, and then that's when it becomes storytelling because you start telling it in in different in different ways. Mm. So maybe you have to tell it slightly different way to the investor than you would do to your customer than you would do to your uh, audience in this country to your audience in that country but the pure story at the heart of it should be the same so the kind of you know you're not telling a different story you're telling the same story maybe in slightly different ways that it sort of resonates with with different people and using that storytelling that's the that's this point of like, okay, well, how do we get people to feel what we want to feel? Mm. And the sort of the better the storytelling, the more that you will, you will feel it, but you could have the best storytelling in the world. And if the pure, if the story isn't pure, then it won't do the good that you want it to do. And after looking on your website at your strategic narrative, the model, mm -hmm. um, it looks like that pure part of the story is intention or tied to intention. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about intention and why that's in, important in the story? Well, I think that, you know, intention or purpose or why, if you want to, however you want to call it, that's then, that's the heart of the story. And then if you, if you stripped everything else away and you polished it, that would be the little shining stone that you're, that you're left with at the beginning. So, and if that intention is not pure and, you know, that's, that's, like clearly we live in a world where a lot of unpure intentions function very well uh because the, their storytelling is very is very great you know and it's sort of like but it doesn't you see the the harm that 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 does for some reason like coca-cola like jumps <laughs> into my mind um not that coca-cola are the most evil inflict the most evil on the world you know i'm sure there's there's lots there's lots of worse but like what it but their story somehow is so great, you know, even when I think of Coca, I can't be mad at Coca-Cola, you know, like, like, you know, my son and cold and like a uh, cold drink on a hot day and the, but the, with a sort of some kind of childlike joy and a sort of and a, and a good feeling. And it's like, ah, oh, isn't that like, isn't that great? <laughs> and that's the kind of the, there's they've built this sort of, you know, story. But if we if we really kind of take all of that away, we find, you know, what's the kind of chemical <laughs> compound of, of Coca-Cola? Uh, what about, like, what what is at its heart? Um, even if they say, you know, well, they want to spread joy, like that's their, that's their, their, their purpose. And it's like, well, that's a great, that's a good purpose. But uh, the, the information also has to come into play now. Because what is the, what is the, what is the fact of, uh, of Coca-Cola? Um, what sort of harm does it? What harm? What effect does it have on on the body, on the on teeth, on uh, and on and on the planet? And it's okay, but like, but the story is pure, and it makes people feel good. Yeah, yeah. And again, a, a double win in that the the liquid itself, you know, there is a, a, a kind of chemical uh, change with the with the there's an effect of the of the liquid itself. Um, but also then, the, yeah, built, built around it, this bigger sort of story, which it has so, it's kind of so much sort of built built into it. But this is when we look at this, you look at the Coca-Cola, the brand, you know, and there's so much kind of baked into it. But that is how language works. And that's how kind of story works. If we want to look at kind of what a story is, if we take the word, take the word Coca-Cola, and, you know, that, that has brings forth an immediate kind of uh, package of, of, of story, of data and, um, and feeling. And if we look at, with, with intention in there, and then if we look at cow as a word, from my, when my son was two, 
cow meant uh, sort of moo and milk. It's a very simple story. Um, now for me, cow means moo and milk, but also meat. Because when you're a child, you know, it's not cow and beef, you know, a nice trick of language to keep the two, <laughs> the two things separate. And when that discovery comes, what? We're eating a cow? Uh, the, that's um, a, very, <laughs> a very big twist to the story. Uh, and for me, it means, you know, meat, but oh no, I shouldn't eat too much red meat. Uh, I shouldn't eat meat at all. I should go uh, vegetarian and, and oh, the Amazon. I hope it didn't come from the Amazon, the deforestation and uh, climate crisis. And uh, our meat is murder. And, uh, and you know, now the story is very, very complex and very kind of loaded and is a real, like, it gives me, does not give me a good feeling. Um, but for my uh, Hindu friend, it has a completely different story attached to it also. And uh, I am unable to know that story firsthand, but my story of the story is you know, divinity and uh, the mother. And, um, but still the same word. It's the same word. So how can, for people that are watching and they, there's so much information, there's different cultural connotations to the way that we identify these, uh, intentions. How can we, um, ensure that we are on track to have a healthy, pure story or intention? Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Well, first sign up to my nine step. No, <laughs> um, but I think the the idea of again being aware of the the story the storied nature of reality of our lives again is that first is that first step as we spoke about before that you're going around and you're spotting the stories and you're seeing the thing finding identifying all these things that are are stories that you had hadn't perhaps realised were story that you had thought was just the way it is that you thought were normal and then. So the first step, let's say, is awareness. And then the second step would be, okay, okay, now I can consciously, now I'm aware of how much is story, or how much of my life is various stories. Now I can maybe, I choose the stories I want and I can then start to refine them. And I can, okay, no, I'm not happy with this story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it. Um, and then, okay, then with what intention am I changing it? What's the point of, what do I want to change this story? What story do I want? So to spend that time to do that work and look into what you, is that is important to you. I want like I want to say purpose. I worry if they be perhaps suffer from kind of purpose fatigue, and some people will be like, "Oh, look, purpose! Like, I've got enough to can deal with without putting like a purpose." And I've got to get the kids ready for school. I've got to you know make sure they're fed. I've got to pay the damn rent. Um. But actually, if you have purpose, doing all those things, making the money to pay the rent, to live your life, if it is imbued with purpose, everything becomes a meaningful act and everything becomes worth doing. OK, now I have to do my, my tax return at the end of the month and uh, it's, it's tough, but you know the work I do has a purpose, so I must do that if I want to continue to do the work. If purpose is too, is a bit too hard, you know, I've got to get up in the morning and get my purpose on and get purposing out there. If that story is too hard, belief is then you can lean back on belief. Belief can can hold you. Okay, purpose, I've got to go out and be purposeful, but belief can can catch you and hold you and, and lift you up. And to spend some time thinking about what you believe in, mm. and that doesn't have to have any kind of spiritual connotation, but if you spend some time to to look into it and say, okay, what do I believe? What is important? What does support me? What does lift me up? Um, that will help you to to do the things that you have to do, and they will be, they will be more meaningful, and they will be more more enjoyable, and they will be it will be a richer experience. Even if you say, but it's all it's all just made up, you know, I made it all up. Like it's my story it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's all made up. So why don't, why not make up make up a story that you that you want to live? Right. And I think that even having your mindset 
uh, anchored in things that are um, forward thinking, that are promoting growth and promoting life, sort of that life force is a great way to set an, an intention as well. Like, is this um, um, positive? Is this uh, feeding that type of energy? Or is it taking from me? Is it, um, is it uh, costing me a lot to set this intention? Uh, I know that in my life, that's how I sometimes gauge my intention. Could you give us uh, an example, like a, be it mundane or profound? I mean, is that something you do like before going to the shops, like, or is it like, oh, every three months you kind of reset? Like, how do how do you, how do you work it? Well, even uh, eating a meal. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, some different food examples. I know that uh, I'm mindful when I eat about what I'm eating. And whether it's um, you're someone who is living a vegan lifestyle or a carnivore lifestyle, whatever that is, the act of mindfulness, knowing your source, um, understanding the sustain, it's sustaining you, um, having a sense of this old concept of prayer or of just grace towards um, what is nurturing you. To me, that is contributing to life force and to positive growth mindset. So I always look at intention on just simple acts that I'm doing, which creates mindfulness and it creates sort of that anchored pureness in in my own story. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean that on a very practical level, that's what a, a kind of intention or a purpose or a, a pure story is good for, is that it answers all the questions of, you have an answer to, should I do this or should I not do that? And you have something very quickly to turn to and say, okay, is it, does it fit? Is it in alignment with the, with the story I want to be, I want to be telling? Is it in alignment with my, with my intention and my purpose? And if not, okay, well, then it's a no. Um, and what a, like, actually relief that is <laughs> mm. in, uh, to have that kind of decision-making, uh, um, to have an answer, to be able to, like, to take that pressure off yourself and actually have a kind of system that you can turn to and, and look at and be like, okay, no, that, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Do you think that stories have a beginning, a middle and an end? Um, I think that's storytelling. And that's the, that's the kind of most presumed, um, obvious sort of storytelling. But I mean, does pop fiction have a beginning, a middle and an end? It does because it's in linear time. Like you go into the movie theatre, you sit, you watch it, that's the beginning, <laughs> halfway through is the middle and then it's the end. Right. But it's not a, it's not necessarily a linear story. And I think our brains don't necessarily remember things as kind of beginning, middle and end. I think we much more, we remember the feeling, you know, we remember this sort of, uh, um, yeah, the emotional reactions and, you know, maybe of, we put that there and we store that there and perhaps that's why Pulp Fiction is such a satisfying film is because actually that's much more how our brains kind of uh, store store the story. Um, I think we like that beginning, middle and end, you know, and then, okay, if the end is the beginning, then isn't that the, the hero's journey, um, the classic uh, model where, you know, the, the end is the beginning but but changed you know it comes it comes full circle and and we we end where we begun but but changed having brought something back and um being able to do good in that in that spot but yeah i think there are there are uh, as many kind of ways to tell a story as there are stories to tell i feel like the audience can take away from this the difference between a story and storytelling and would you say that it's important for us to understand the purity of our story, but then be able to have this flexibility and continuously change the storytelling around us? So part of us is anchored in you know, something kind of still, that I am space, and then everything else is sort of moving around us. Yeah, that, that sounds like a great way to... To go out into the world and I think also like it's useful to have that that anchor and that and something that you believe in but I think after a while if that doesn't kind of serve you then also feel free to to sort of to swap that out but it's just nice to have one thing it's nice to have something 
to believe in, right? Or something to kind of like to hold hold you to. I mean, I relatively recently, you know, kind of um, atheism and sort of cynicism served me well. And after a while, it was well. Don't think this is serving me anymore. Let me try on some. Let me try some different belief systems. Let me try some different things and sort of see how that see how that works and if that serves me better um and that kind of that was being serving me in my kind of local immediate like i want to be happy in my life but also does it serve me as part of the kind of the bigger um global universal sort of context also and i think that's also, that's an important thing like we want to put ourselves we want these big intentions and we want to be part of something bigger and we want to have sort of noble good intentions to go out into the world and do good but also we are um by a trick of our nervous systems and our, our kind of reality perception we are individuals we we experience ourselves as as individuals whatever the the truth may be um so we also need a kind of local personal story that is like, well, look, I need also need something that's going to serve me like physically right now, physically, emotionally. Um, and ideally those two things are, are in alignment so that the, the serving yourself also serves a, a, a greater good. Why do you think it's so difficult for people to change their narrative and to find their story? I think there's a lot of comfort in a story, whatever it is, if it's your same old story, you know, if it's your nice familiar story, like my friend who didn't want to like tear down his nice comfy house, even though it's filled with old magazines <laughs> mm -hmm. and whatever's under the lumpy carpet, like there's just a kind of, there's a safety and a familiarity in just knowing, okay, yeah, this is how it, this is how it is. Like, it's scary to sort of peek over the edge and look out and be like, oh, what? Everything is just a story like and we're just all making it up as we go along and it's uh you know i want to know that that's real and that's that and that's that that feels good you know even if it's actually kind of restricting me from from growth from uh from living a a full and 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 happy life you know it's just like okay now but i, I want to stay in my little uh stay in my little my little shell my little box because it's because it's mine because it's comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's comfortable. Even if it's uncomfortable, like it's mine, like it's my box. Like, don't why? Why are you trying to take that away? <laughs> right. It is scary. It, there's a lot of fear. Change uh, brings up a lot of fear, and changing your story often changes everything around you. Your reality then changes, and and I think that can be risky for a lot of people to do that. They want to know what's going to happen when they change the story even though they feel like this, their narrative is not working for them. So what would you advise people that, that feel that they need to make a change, but they're afraid to take that risk? Well, then I think the first, um, you know, this is absolutely human nature, right? This kind of fear, like fear to, to take that step, but also wanting to do it, you know, that, 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 that weird contradiction of, of wanting it, but not wanting it and and then staying in that horrible like sort of uh dissonant discordant space and um, then I, I like the first story has got to be then well look, i'm somebody who i'm an explorer and i'm i'm brave and i'm adventurous and i want to go out into this into the unknown because i know that if i stay here it's not going to do me it's not going to do me any good and okay it might be hard and there might be some some sad times and some bad times, but actually that makes a better story. A story isn't any good if it like they started happy, were happy in the middle and they all lived happily ever after at the end. That's, that's not a good story. So, okay, there's going to be some like juicy parts to this story and it's, it's going to be tough, but wow, it's going to be a good story. Um, so I guess that actually is the ability to just sort of step to one side and kind of, See, oh look, here's the this character in this story. Like, let's like let's get to the exciting part. Like, to be able to just to take that ability, just to be able to step to one side and like, and view yourself, your life, 
uh, as a story and see, okay, yeah, right, let's, uh, it's just a story. Like, what's, like, there's going to be good bits, there's going to be happy bits, there's going to be sad bits. When you're working with clients, is there typically a goal that you set for, for I, I know we talked about beginning, middle, and end, but in terms of changing that story or making, you know, taking the risk, what do you, what do you say the goal should be? I think the initial goal is always clarity because the hardest thing for when I work with people, whether it's an individual, whether it's a, a, a founder of a startup, and even uh, in, to many extents more so the, um, uh, the CEOs or team leaders of kind of bigger corporations, it's the, you can't see the wood for the trees as the, the expression is. I think it's for the, it's most impactful on the, with the startup, uh, the startup crew because oftentimes it's people who really care about what they're doing you know they're making it's their business it's their baby they've invested a lot into it and they care about it and they've built it all up around themselves they've worked really hard to build up to where they are but they've built it up around them and they're in the middle of it and there's literally no way on earth that they could see what someone coming from the outside would need to see so the bit that they might think, the bit of their story they might think is you know really interesting and you know the cool part, just doesn't mean anything to to someone coming from outside. And they've got to be able to get that clarity to look at it, look back on it, and see it, and see okay, right, I get it. What do what do I need to say that people will get it when they come to it? And that's why I I really like the process that I've um, that I've created. Because it's not me saying, right, come to me and I will we'll find your story and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you in a package and be like, oh, look, here you go. It's not the kind of madmen, like big reveal. Hey, here's the big idea. I'm not actually creating anything. I'm just getting what's out of their head, getting it up on the wall. We can see it together. And then I will go and I, there, there'll be this process, this kind of alchemical uh, distillation, which is better for me to do on my own. Um, but I'm not creating anything new. I'm just distilling what we have created, what we've co-created, what we've captured. And so that it can be, you can see it from a new, a new perspective. And that's the, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing to just have that, that perspective shift. Looking at that pure intention, the heart of the story. Exactly that. So it's one, when you've got that, then you can be like, okay, now I could tell anybody this and they'll get it. But now, okay, what, how do we then turn it into something that 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 works in 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 more kind of nuanced situations that can uh, yeah then it can be about kind of performance and it can be about um uh results but with, must come from that that sort of pure pure place and it must come from that external shift you know you've got it, you've got it out of yourself now and now it's now it's there and you can you can share it and you can show it Whereas you couldn't before because it was it was it was too deep. Mm. How long does this process take typically? Um, <laughs> much faster than most people think. Like most people, like would say, well, shouldn't this take like four weeks? And I said, well, it <laughs> can do if you want to, but or we could just uh, we can do it in four hours. Mm -hmm. the, the initial like, um, yeah, the initial workshop can be done in four hours to, and then another four hours for me. So in a day, you can have your your pure story. Okay. So if someone is sitting at home and of course they're unable to go to your website and to work with you uh, directly, what's a, what's a simple task they can do at home to just help them find their true story, the heart of their story, and also kind of help them with some storytelling in their lives? Well, first let's do the, let's look at the purpose. Let's look at the intention and the five whys is a good, is a good way. Just keep asking, like, find your annoying inner child. You kept asking them, why, why, why? <laughs> and sort of, and say, like, and just ask yourself that. And so, uh, okay, yeah, I want to make uh, cupcakes for for a living. It's like, well, why? Um, because I enjoyed, like, baking, whatever. Why? And just why, and why, and why, and why? And after five or seven or however many whys you can you can go uh then you should have like some idea 
because you've just you've done that like you've refined it yourself you know you've managed to sort of like kind of polish it down a few steps um and in terms of storytelling find your audience i'd say see who it is that is most important that you you tell this story to and then you can kind of sequence that so like if you need investment first then your first audience is is an investor you know if you need a co-founder then that's your first audience because if you're just starting out really it's just you and your story you know and you're out in the world and you've got to you've got to you've got to get people people on board and you can kind of you can you can, you can step that you can step that along there's no point in doing your like big fancy cross-platform campaign if you don't even have the money to to make the thing to make your, your cupcakes oh why was it cupcakes um cronuts um and yeah i think that like see who purify your story with your with your whys and then you've got something you know you're like okay this is the real reason and then like okay if i told that to an investor like would they resonate with it okay maybe it needs a little uh, a little something i would also when when you when you found that like you've got your you found your whys maybe do it one time kind of personally and one time globally so you've got your sort of two intentions your kind of personal local survival one and your global universal um purpose one and ideally they you know check that they are in alignment because if they're not then it's never mm -hmm. going to work you know so would you just get out out a pen and paper and just call them it and do personal global or I do one at a time, but do whatever, do however you do it. But like, yeah, go go for five wise, go for seven wise if you if you if you feel it. You're having um, a good day. Yeah, exactly. Maybe eight. Yeah, go ten. Who cares? Like, just keep just keep going until you feel until it feels Why? like. <laughs> <laughs> because you got to keep getting deep. You got to just keep like. Every time, get in there. Every time you think you've got out of the room, you've got to get out of that next room. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I know I learned a lot about the difference between the pure story and the st storytelling and got some um, great tips and, and wonderful wisdom from speaking with you today. So I really appreciate your time. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I feel like we've just got started. Uh, that's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you liked my conversation with James Harrop today, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm a brand new podcaster and I deeply appreciate your support.